know the first question I had, but I wanted to jump into Paul because you brought him up. And to me, I feel like he, maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like he invented anti-Semitism. Um, I think there's, I can't think of a more enduring, vicious, libel, libelous slander than seeing the Jews murdered God. And that's a lie that's hard to shake off. You know, any anywhere we go, every century, we're kind of blamed for, you know, whether we um, either were the synagogue of Satan and we did a deal with the devil. There's always some type of, uh, you know, kind of blood libel against us that we can't shake off. And I personally, I think that has a lot to do with Paul. So um, can you explain a little bit about who Paul was? Because he claims he was a Pharisee, which I doubt. And he also claims he was a Jew, which I doubt. So can we just understand him? Because I feel like he doesn't get enough attention. Right. So we need to explore this. And this is bigger than Paul. The church had a problem. And the problem is the Jews. You see, if the Jews recognize that Jesus is not the Messiah, this poses a theological conundrum for the church, for those who are spreading it. Christians who are being evangelized have to ask the question, who were the people who met Jesus? Who were the people who were there in time and in place? Well, Christian missionaries say, well, the Jews were in the land of Israel. They encountered him. And the idea of Messiah is uniquely Jewish. Then why, tell me, did the Jews not believe in Jesus? That means, why don't the Jews believe in this? We're the only people that can read this Bible in its original language. The idea of a Messiah is uniquely Jewish. No one else believed in an idea of a, a Mashiach. I mean, this idea of a Mashiach did not exist at all in any way in any other religion. It didn't exist. The word Christ meant nothing to the Greco-Roman world. Nothing. So then why don't the Jews believe in the Christian Messiah? Well, you've got to come up with an answer. Now, you could come up with the following answer, which would be the correct answer. Missionaries would say that, well, the Jews read their Bible, examined the evidence, and drew a very different conclusion. People go, well, why? <laughs> because that means a lot of the Jews draw a very different conclusion. They can't say that. They never say that. Only liberal Christians say that. The kind of people we're not worried about. But the serious Christians can't concede that point. They can't concede it because this is an enormous credibility problem for the church. And therefore, Paul and other writers in the Christian Bible have to characterize, have to portray the Jews as essentially demonic. They're enemies of God in, in a supernatural way. There's a veil over their eyes, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 4. There's scales over their eyes. They're blind from the truth. And we find this in the book of Romans as well, that God blinded them for some reason to uh, ignite their jealousy among Gentiles who would embrace the grafted branches who would embrace it. This is completely contrary to Tanakh, because in Tanakh, the, the message of Mashiach is that the Jews understand it, and the Gentiles grab the shirt of a Jew and say, take us with you, for we have heard that God is with you. I mean, this is completely reversed in the Jewish scriptures. In Tanakh, it is the Jewish pe people. It is Beis Yaakov l'chul v'nelcha. It is the, the house of Jacob that gets it, that comes and goes, and all the nations go by our light. See Isaiah chapter 60. See, I mean, Zechariah chapter 8, verse 23. See Jeremiah chapter 6. It's all over the place. See Isaiah 49, verse 6. The whole purpose of the Jewish people is to be a light to the nations in Oral Agoyim. That's the whole point. I mean, it's just the reverse. So what you must do is you must say things about the Jews that are not complimentary. Christian anti-Semitism is understandable. If I had been a Christian and all I was exposed to was the New Testament, I would hate me too. Because that's how the Jews are characterized by Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14 through 16. 
First Thessalonians is the oldest surviving book in the entire New Testament, written about 49 or 50, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus Christ, contrary to all mankind, enemies of God, forbidding us to preach to the Gentiles. That's Paul's writing that. You have Peter screaming this obnoxious stuff about the Jews and early on in the book of Acts, John characterizing the Jews as the seed of the devil, a literally a demonic people. And that's where the church comes up with this, because you can either explain the Jews as disagreeing with the conclusions of the church, which creates a huge new problem, or conversely, you could say that the Jews are so demonic, they're so dark, that they're such enemies of God that they know the truth. The devil knows the truth. Satan understands the truth, but denies him anyway. And only the devil can do that. And that's exactly how the Jews are portrayed in the Gospels. The Jews are portrayed in the Gospels as knowing the truth, knowing that Jesus really rose from the dead. Pontius Pilate gets it that Jesus is innocent. Pontius Pilate's wife who were introduced to in Matthew chapter 27, she knows that Jesus is innocent because of a dream she had the night before, but only the hordes of Jews are screaming, crucify him. And as a result, we would pay an enormous price for this. So that's where the anti-Semitism is inflamed. It's inflamed that the Jews control the world. We control Pontius Pilate. We control Rome. We control who gets crucified and who doesn't. And that character, that, that, characterization of the Jews remains and moves through the, the protocols of the elders of Zion. I mean, that's what Nikolai II, the Zechrai, the Tsar of Russia, Alexander III, Tsar of Russia in the late 19th century, really wicked people who engage in horrible, horrible anti-Semitic acts because they bought this caricature of the Jew. And therefore, when the protocols of the elders of Zion was written in the early 20th century, it made complete sense to the Russian Orthodox Christians. Wow, fascinating. So would you say that that um, this man, Paul, who came from Damascus, who was previously harassing Jews, was an actual Pharisee and was an actual Jew? Or could no, it be that no, I don't people? think he was a Pharisee at all. I think that he claimed to be a Pharisee because it gave him the most credibility. At the time, in the Christian Bible, strangely, the Pharisees are characterized as the gold standard. It's not only right. in the New Testament, but also Josephus. I mean, that was the gold standard to be the sure. people who sit in the, in the seat of Moses. Now, no doubt, just like today, I'll say something I don't think I've ever said on air. If you ask people about who are not Jewish about Judaism, the denomination of the Jewish faith, the Jews that people know most about, not just in the United States, but also in Finland, are Orthodox Jews. Right. It would be, I don't mean, I'm not trying to offend anyone, but if you asked people what's the difference between what Reform and Conservative Judaism believes, I don't think very many people will be able to tell you. I mean, the iteration of Judaism that people know is the Orthodox traditional Torah halachic Judaism. That's what everybody knows. And no one's quite sure. That's the same deal 2,000 years ago. Judaism was the only monotheistic Abrahamic religion in the world. I mean, today, there are other religions that are monotheistic. We had no competition at the time. It was a very popular religion. So people knew about us. But Paul's attitude, his chameleon approach to whatever you need to be, you can become in order to convert people to assert his CV, his credentials as a Pharisee in the early Galatians 1 and 2, Philippians 3, his, his hostility towards the early Christians that he, that he claims to have had. I'm not sure that he actually had this. He may have amped it up in order to lend credibility. All of this points us in a very different, his Greek and his affection for Greek thinking his understanding of Chiasimes, of the resurrection of the dead, where there was no physical resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15. All of that and more points to you have a person who is familiar with 
the word Pharisee is an anachronism. With what we now call Orthodox Judaism, he was definitely very familiar with it, but he himself was not. He was he was influenced in a, in a Greek way. And if Luke is right, the author of Acts is correct. If he came from Tarsus, Paul doesn't make that claim, but Luke does. So then he would have come from a city that was known for its thinking, its philosophic, its, as a philosophical center of the of the Greek world. So none of that points to him being a Pharisee. 